You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, this is Brian McClanahan, and this is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute, covering uh, April 4th through April 8th, 2016, episode 21. We had a pretty interesting week at the Abbeville Institute, so we've got a lot to talk about. We're going to start this week with a pretty familiar theme with our uh, material, and that would be the PC attack on the South, which we've covered in a couple of conferences. And then we're going to talk about um, some Southern culture. And then we're going to look at um, a couple of political issues and how the South fits into that. Uh, So before we begin, though, let's uh, make sure that everyone remembers we have a summer school coming up. June 12th through 17th, 2016. Uh, Details are available on our website. But I think it's going to be a very good summer school. Uh, It is our 14th summer school. So we've been around doing this for 14 years. But the topic is the Southern tradition and the renewal of America. And uh, what does the South have to offer America? Why should people pay attention to the Southern tradition today? I think this is something that... uh, We really need to uh, hammer and uh, talk about the South is America. Um, And that actually, if you look at current events, uh, something that did happen this past week that really shows that was uh, the popular singing contest on uh, on television, the last season of the show American Idol, which has been going on almost as long as the Institute's been around, 15 years. And as usual, the South wins the contest. In fact, uh, if you look at the last four contestants, they're all from the South. Um, two from Mississippi, one from Louisiana, and one from Texas. And uh, the the winner, uh, the last two were from Mississippi. So, uh, again, the South is America. People just don't realize this, but it's true. Uh, and um, unfortunately, we're in such a hysterical time that uh, any time you say that you're in favor of the South, uh, this almost brings immediate consternation from from the general public at large. But if people just realize, and this is something that we have to, a very positive affirmation of what the South is and the Southern tradition and what's valuable in the Southern tradition. You know, just saying you, you like the South, there are so many great things about the South politically, socially, culturally, uh, that the South can show America uh, in leading the way that I think we need to start talking about this being very positive. Uh, and it's not always arguing about the war or uh, about the context of the war. I think that turns people off a lot of times. So remember, the South is 400 years. Uh, The Southern history is 400 years, starting with Jamestown in 1607 and moving forward. And so we have to remember that when we start talking about the South. Be very positive about it. Understand Southern history outside of that four-year period that everyone likes to focus on and call Southerners all kinds of nasty names because of it. Uh, Which, as we've already gone over on this podcast, a lot of things they say are just untrue. Uh, But, and actually we're going to talk about that in in one of the last um, uh, essays for the week. So, we start, though, with a common theme. Again, the PC attack on the South and how this is becoming... <clears throat> again, as I said, hysterical. Uh, I just saw this week that uh, there was a Dominican friar in a in a college who was accused by students. They thought he was a Klan member because he had on his his robes. I mean, this is how silly this. Uh, for, it shows two things: one, how hysterical this whole thing has become, and two, how stupid people really are. Uh, you know. I, I, when I was uh, as an undergraduate, which wasn't that long ago, I mean, we're not talking about you know 50 years ago. When I was an undergraduate, no one would ever have accused a Dominican of fri- a Dominican friar. They would have known what this was. I mean, of, of being a a clan member. Of course, the, the the Dominicans had a had a field day with this and pointing out all kinds of funny things about that. But it shows the lack of education and uh, higher education in America and how uh, you know people are just so hypersensitive, and that's not real education. Education is the exchange of ideas, Uh, and someone who is really interested in education should be open to ideas and and discussing these ideas. 
But what we have in American society today is a completely closed-minded uh, American public, and we have a closed-minded American education system. It really is about re-education. Uh, and if you deviate from the standard interpretation, uh, if you want to go to our Facebook page where I've been, uh, or where we've been running a uh, a post, why the war was not about slavery, you'll find that you have many individuals who are not interested in a real public discourse on the issue, and this comes out of our education system. Uh, and. So I think this is the major problem with the PC attack on the South, is that people don't have a firm foundation or an interest in exchanging ideas. So this first piece was entitled Lee's Memory, and it was written by Philip Lee. And Philip Lee um, has written a number of books on the war. Uh, he speaks all over the South, Civil War roundtables, and uh, he's... Uh, he is an open-minded historian, amateur historian. He's not a professional, but an open-minded amateur historian. And as we've also talked about, those people are typically the best. So he talks about uh, how we've had this growing hostility towards Confederate symbols. Uh, and he brings up Washington and Lee University. And how because of the politically correct, correct climate, there's even maybe a possibility that Lee will be removed from the name of the university. I mean, forget about George. Look, this is how silly this is. Forget about the fact that both Washington and Lee were slaveholders. Washington didn't free his slaves during his lifetime. Uh, and Washington uh, was, as, was the symbol of America for the first 80 years of its history, until the war, and Lincoln became the symbol of America, and uh, hopefully it will be published, but uh, Dr. Livingston, the uh, president of the Institute, is writing a book about the symbolism of Washington and, and Lincoln, and how Lincoln becomes the symbol uh, beginning in the 1860s. He says that, you know, this is a possibility, but no one has, has proposed this yet, but he thinks it's coming. Uh And he says that you know, the, the problem is that historians have not really stepped up and said, okay, look, this is going too far. Uh, now, he does say, others who think that the disdain is excessive lack the will to speak out due to the prevailing op opposite sentiment among their peers and the public. So he says if this actually was proposed, he doesn't think that anyone would speak out against it. And he says, quote, it takes courage for historians who have spent years earning the favor of others to express a contrary viewpoint because it may adversely affect their popularity, reputations, and book sales. And he's true. This is very true. He's, he's correct about that. People are, are cowering because they don't want to be called a, quote, unquote, neo-Confederate. Or they, they believe that because of the general public sentiment that if you say anything positive about the South, well... You're just a racist, or uh, you, you you believe in slavery. Well, we know this isn't true, uh, but this is what people will say. Again, go look at the Facebook page and see the comments that are under that post, why the war was not about slavery, and see what people are saying. It's it's hysterics. You know, people are, uh, are so hypersensitive, they can't even discuss an issue uh, reasonably, and intellectually. And he says, nonetheless, Mississippi, uh, Mississippi and Shelby Foote set a good example of such pluck 50 years ago in the afterword of the second volume of his three-volume Civil War narrative. And this is Foote's quote. Quote, I am indebted also to the governors of my native state and the adjoining states of Arkansas and Alabama for helping to lessen my sectional bias by reproducing and their actions during the several years that went into the writing of this volume, much that was least admirable in the position my forebears occupied when they stood up to Lincoln. I fervently hope it is true that history never repeats itself, but I know in watching these three gentlemen it can be terrifying in its approximations, even when the reproduction is in miniature.
And he goes on to say, Washington and Lee would not be the admired school it is today without Lee's legacy. After he became president of Washington College in 1865, he attracted financial donations from all over the country. His reputation was a magnet that drew some of the best students in the South and increasingly from other parts of the country as well. The school's present status owes more to his memory than to Washington's or anyone else's. To remove his name would be to deny the credit he deserves. Nonetheless, it could become a consequence of the present trend towards Southern cultural genocide that is terrifying in its approximations. So, there are people, there are people that have PhDs, there are people that are historians, whether they're professional or not, like Philip Lee, who are willing to take a stand and say, okay, enough is enough. But we need more of them. And we're trying. But we need your help in that. Remember, fighting back PC attacks in the South is fun, but it isn't free. So please, and make, I didn't make a pitch at the beginning of the podcast, but please remember to make a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. It will help us keep the podcast going, the website running, the conferences going, the educational opportunities. It'll help us do all these things, keep the lights on, and help us try to beat back this PC attack on the South. Now, all we can do is try. All we can do is put the material out there, and we will find converts. You've, you, I mean, all the time we get very nasty comments from people, but we also get a lot of positive comments from people that are saying that said, look, I didn't even know this existed. I didn't know there was anyone who thought like me. I didn't know. Or I once thought the other way, and you have opened my eyes to something else. So there are very few people willing to stand in the breach. There are very few people left. But uh, I think we can, we can get more if we're willing to stand up to these things. So, the next piece, again, focused on this particular issue, and I wrote this piece. And its title is At Arlington, and it's about the poem by James Ryder Randall, At Arlington. And I will read this poem. It's not very long. But uh, the, the beginning of this, of this piece was a little uh, discussion about the PC attack on the South. And it was stimulated by something that someone had sent me from a piece in Time magazine by James McWhorter. And James McWhorter is a Lincoln apologist. He is one of the editors of the, uh, of the Lincoln papers. Um, and he wrote this piece about the Maryland State song, Maryland, My Maryland. And so if you don't know, that song, which it's been under attack before, but now there's a real push by the Maryland legislature to change the words of the song, to actually substitute uh, different a different version of the song. Keep the song the state song, but use different lyrics. And the funny thing about this particular piece by McWhorter is he says, you know, Maryland, my Maryland is a dissident song. He uses that word dissident. <gasps> it's dissident. Well, uh, I agree. Uh, I say this is true if using the standard definition of the word, opposition to official policy, especially that of an authoritarian state. And I point out anti-Hitler Germans were dissidents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Sam Adams, and the rest of the founding generation were dissidents. Anti-Lenin, anti-Stalin Russians were dissidents. Demonstrators at Tiananmen Square in 1989 were dissidents. And so I say it seems dissidents are usually those on the right side of history. Obviously, McWhorter disagrees. But he also says some really stupid things. That's, that's stupid. But he says some other stupid things in this piece. He says, because a song is pro-Confederate, it is also, quote, pro-slavery and pro-secession. Now, I do agree Maryland my Maryland is pro-secession. Randall was openly for Maryland secession. But pro-slavery, there's not a word in the song dedicated to the institution. And even if it is pro-secession, so what? This would be opposition. McWhorter would be opposed then to free thinking and self-determination. And I give a quote from Abraham Lincoln in 1848. This is Lincoln's words. Quote, any people, anywhere, being inclined and having the power, have the right to rise up and shake off the existing government and form a new one that suits them better. This is a most valuable, a most sacred right, a right which we hope and believe is to liberate the world. That's Lincoln in 1848. Of course, he had a different tune in 61. 
And then, of course, McWhorter wrung his hands about the fact the poem expresses patriotism to the failed Confederacy, classifies Lincoln a despot, and calls Northerners vandals. This is heresy. And, of course, if you believe these things, you must be silenced. Lincoln was a despot, though, and, and Northerners did vandalize the South, so those things are true. So this is the stuff that's out there that, you know, in Time magazine... You never would have seen this 60 years ago. But it's there now, and this is what we're facing. Now, Marilyn My Marilyn made Randall famous, but he thought his best poem was at Arlington. And when I read the poem, including the annotation at the beginning of the poem and why he wrote it, it is so good. And there's a part in the poem about bayonets forcing women away from the graves, the Confederate graves at Arlington. And make no mistake, the bayonets are not there anymore. But current efforts to cleanse the American landscape of all things Confederate is a modern reconstruction. And McWhorter and others are demonstrating that the point of all of this is not really to make us feel better about the past, to heal the wounds of the past for different groups in American society, but it's to erase opposition to authoritarianism and self-determination. Or it's, it's, not to, it's to erase self-determination, ultimately. The ideas of it. It's dissident. This is it. He he exposed, I think unknowingly, but he exposed the real issue here. It is, they want you to conform, assimilate, or we will force you to assimilate. You must think like we think. And anyone who doesn't needs to be called out and purged. This is Stalinesque. That's what political correctness is. That's what this piece is, whether McWhorter realizes it or not. And he says, oh, well, you know, all I'm, all I'm interested in is putting it in the history books. We'll, we'll still read it in the history books, and then we can laugh at it. And this is, he. I open my talks about uh, the war, and I, I give a talk. And I'm such an educated, uh, erudite individual. I make these talks, and I bring out this poem, and then I pause. And then I read the lines, and then I pause. And people, ha, 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 ha. They laugh at these silly Southerners who would think such ridiculous things. Now Lincoln's a tyrant. (laughs) I am so smart. This is David Blight standing up in his Yale classes and saying the same thing. Yes, uh, I am so intelligent that uh, I am called to get on the radio all over the United States. And I tell these backwards hayseeds that the war was all about slavery. And these people just need to know how smart I am. And McWhorter needs to tell people how smart he is. He's so smart he makes people laugh at this silly, this silly. Can you believe these silly stuff? This is dissident. So let's read at Arlington. And I think you'll understand what people were saying. This, This actually is funny. At Arlington. By James Ryder Randall. On the day that the graves of the federal soldiers buried at Arlington were decorated, in 1869, a number of ladies entered the cemetery for the purpose of placing flowers on the graves of 30 Confederates. Their progress was stopped by bayonets, and they were not allowed to perform their mission of love. During the night, a high wind arose, and in the morning, all the floor offerings that had been placed the day before upon the federal graves were found piled upon the mounds under which reposed the 30 Confederates. The broken column, reared in air to him which made our country great, can almost cast its shadow where the victims of a grand despair and long, long ranks of death await, the last loud trump, the judgment sun, which come for all and soon or late will come for those at Arlington. And that vast sepulchral repose, the thousands reap from every fray, the men in blue who once uprose in battle front to smite their foes, the Spartan bands who wore the gray, the combat o'er, the death hung done. 
in summer blaze or winter snows, they kept the truth, truce, at Arlington. And almost lost in myriad graves, those who gained the unequal fight, are mounds that hide Confederate braves, who reck not how the north wind raves, in dazzling day or dimmest night, over those who lost and those who won. Death holds no parley, which was right. Jehovah judges Arlington. The dead had rest, the dove of peace brooded o'er both the, with equal wings. To both had come the great surcease, the last omnipotent release from all the world's hilarious things. To bugle deaf and signal gun, they slept like heroes of old Greece beneath the glebe at Arlington. And in the springs be night and rain, the sweet May woke her harp of pines, teaching her choir a thrilling strain of jubilee to land and main. She danced an emerald down the lines. Denying largesse bright to none, she saw no difference in the signs that told who slept at Arlington. She gave her grasses and her showers to all alike who dreamed in dust. Her songbirds wove their dainty bowers amid the jasmine buds and flowers and piped with an impartial trust. Wastes of the air and liberal sun, their guileless glees were kind and just to friend and foe at Arlington. And mid the generous spring, where there came some women of the land who strove to make this funeral field of fame, glad as the May God's altar flame, with rosy wreaths of mutual love, unmindful who had lost or won. They scorned the jargon of a name, no, sor no north, no south at Arlington. Between their pious thought and God stood files of men with brutal steel. The garlands placed on rebel sod were trampled in the common clod to die beneath the hireling heel, facing this triumph of the Hun. Our smoky Caesar gave no nod to keep the peace at Arlington. Jehovah judged a bashing man, for in the vigils of the night his mighty storm avengers ran together in one choral clan, rebuking wrong, rewarding right, plucking the wreaths from those who won. The tempest heaped them dewy bright on rebel graves at Arlington. And when the morn came young and fair, Brimful of blushes ripe and red, knee-deep in sky-scent roses there, nature began her earliest prayer above triumphant southern dead. So in the dark and the sun, our cause survives the tyrant's tread and sleeps to wake at Arlington. I love that last line. Our cause survives the tyrant's tread and sleeps to wake at Arlington. This is a call to action. On Wednesday, we ran a piece, another series, and Clyde Wilson sang Byerforth Southerners, part 30. So we've been doing this for a while. And uh, a couple of interesting quotes here. Uh, one by Clyde himself. There's plenty of good his history available to us. It is our job to make it known. And one funny one by Pat Conroy. He just died. It's impossible to explain to a Yankee what tacky is. They simply have no word for it up north. But my God, do they ever need one. And uh, it's fitting that we ran a piece by Fred Reed this week. Uh, and he says, quote, Television was wholesome, sterile, and not very informative. Superman jumped out of windows to promote truth, justice, and the American way, then thought to be related. Of course, this is Fred Reed on the 50s. So let's talk about Fred Reed. We ran a piece, Why They Hate Us, and this was originally published at his website, which is fredoneverything.org. It's a very funny website. But the, he, he wrote this a couple of years ago, and he said, A frequent theme nowadays is why do they hate us? Meaning, why does so much of the world detest the United States? The reasons given are usually absurd. They hate us for our freedom or democracy. They hate us for our cultural superiority. They hate us because we are wonderful. No, he says, actually the reason is simple, if unpalatable. They hate us because we meddle and have meddled. They hate us because we are the most murderous nation on the planet. They hate our insufferable smugness. And he begins by saying, people remember slights. They may not remember them as they actually happen, but they remember them. 
The Civil War ended in 1865, the federal occupation in 1877. Yet today, many Southerners are still bitter, to the point that their emotional loyalty is to the South, not to Washington. Silly? Yes. If you're from the North, grievances matter more to the aggrieved than to the aggrievers. And so then he begins a long discussion of all the things the United States has done in foreign policy over the years that cause hate. The CIA has a word for this. It's called blowback. And... Um, There are several good books about this. Um, one that was written not too long ago, entitled Overthrow. And I can't recall the author. I had it, thought I had the book behind me here on my, on my bookcase. But uh, it's very good. Overthrow is the title. And it gets into this particular issue. And it goes through long, the long history of American imperialism that most people don't want to admit is what we have, imperialism. And so he talks about Mexico and how there are people in Mexico that still hate the United States for what happened in 1848. They talk about, he talks about China and how the Boxer Rebellion is a nice example of opposition to Western imperialism. Most people don't even know what the Boxer Rebellion was. This is actually interesting. When I, when I teach this period in, in American history, uh, I, I, I've had people get very upset with me because I call the United States an empire and I'm highly critical of American foreign policy. This is not to be critical of Americans, the people that went out and uh, the soldiers, for example, were doing what they were told to do. This is not critical of them. It's critical of foreign policy. It's critical of the North. And I think there's actually, when I was in graduate school, uh, an interesting paper. I, the, the person who was writing it got a whole lot of things wrong, but he was on to something. And during the uh, war... There was actually an interest in, or at least right after the war in Reconstruction, there was an interest in Cretan independence. And Americans started to look in a way, because of the war, in a different way at the world. When the war shifted for some to a Holy Crusade to help downtrodden people, and of course those downtrodden people were Southerners, uh, I'm sorry, black Southerners, uh, they thought they were doing a moral justice to these people and 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 righting a moral wrong and avenging them for you know uh, and and destroying Southerners in the process. Of course, uh, they forget their own moral injustice in the American Indian tribes out west. But that's another story. They shifted their goal to looking at other parts of the world and liberating other peoples. And that's how much of this stuff was sold. We have to liberate the. Cubans. We have to liberate the Filipino people. We have to liberate the Cretan people. But in the real motivation was none of that. And there was this wonderful political cartoon that's so hypocritical and so stupid. But it was made in the in 1900 for the 1900 election, and it uses a quote by William McKinley where he says, "You know, the American flag has not been planted on on foreign soil for uh, for empire essentially, but for humanity humanity's sake." Uh, which is so untrue. I mean, we weren't interested in China for helping out poor, helpless Chinese. We were interested in China so we could get markets. We weren't interested in uh, you know, stopping communism in Southeast Asia. I mean, some were interested just in stopping communism, but uh, for the most part, this is some type of you know broader agenda to have more influence in Southeast Asia. And Fred Reed goes on, he says, America is both a rogue state and a bully, constantly attacking countries hopelessly inferior in military strength. Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Panama, Cuba, Iraq, Somalia, Afghanistan. And he says, civil rights, the U.S. has more people in prison than any other country. Many of our cities are festering slums. The world saw the victims of Katrina. Morality, the country is rife with drugs, crime, sex, culture, and education. American students are annually shown to be inferior to those in Thailand, Hungary, Singapore, and so on. America is tasteless and sordid. Look at the movies. He says, yes, some of this isn't fair. And an American might ask, for example, how an Arab country practicing female circumcision, not allowing girls to study, can lecture anyone on morality. I agree. 
but how they see things determines their attitudes. In Google Images, search Abu Ghraib. You will see American army women grinning as they torture and humiliate Arab men. They are having a wonderful time, and the whole world can see those pictures. This was American policy. As I said, it's the foreign policy. Low-ranking girl soldiers did not undertake this kind of thing without approval from command. The general in charge was a woman. Torture is still American policy. Stalin did these sort of things. So did Adolf. So did Pol Pot. And so does the United States. Other countries know it. And he talks about meddling. And how this creates our own problems. So then he asks the question, why do we not behave more sensibly? Americans are obviously not stupid people. Dummies don't build Mars rovers. Yet we seem to have a wanton, almost genetic non-grasp of how others think, which means that we can't predict what they will do. Often Americans just don't care what others think. This, of course, plays into the hands of Hugo Chavez and Osama bin Laden. And he closes, that's why they hate us. We meddle. And I think beginning this piece, and it goes back to Reconstruction, goes back to the period before the war. This is, this is Yankee. Yankees were meddling. This is Ichabod Crane, which Washington Irving, who had a birthday this past week, uh, was so famous for pointing out Yankees meddle. I mean, Ichabod Crane was a personification of Yankees. And so... Uh, when you read that story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, this is why all the New Yorkers made fun of him, because he was a Connecticut Yankee. And he had come into New York and wanted to marry the wealthiest girl in town, and, uh, and they ran him out of town. And he, they made fun of him. If you read the story, you know, how they made fun of Ichabod Crane. And Washington Irving, as a New Yorker, loved the South. He loved the traditional culture of the South. Finally, playing into this political tint is a piece we ran by James J. Kilpatrick, who died not long ago, uh, entitled The Sovereign States. And this is from his book, The Sovereign States. This is the introduction to his essay. And it's not long. It's an essay to his book, I should say. And I think it's a wonderful call to action. It's something that the Institute is doing now in talking about the basis, the real basis of American political history. And so I'm going to read a lot of this essay because I think it's really good. And he begins, Among the more melancholy aspects of the genteel world we live in is a slow decline in the enjoyment that men once found in the combat of ideas, free and unrestrained. I mean, my gosh, he wrote this in 1957. He could write it today. Competition of any sort indeed seems to be regarded these days in our schools and elsewhere as somehow not in very good taste. Uh, the curious doctrines of the Fair Trade Act, vigorous salesmanship is unfair, and retailers are enjoined against discommodating their fellows. Mr. Stevenson's criticism of the administration's foreign policy during the last presidential campaign was not that the policies were so very wrong. They were not bipartisan. With a few robust exceptions, our writers paint in pastels. Our political scholars write a sort of ruffled sleeve, harpsichord prose. We duel with soft pillows or with button foils. Our ideas have lace on them. We are importuned to steer with moderation down the middle of the road. These chamber music proprieties I acknowledge simply to say now that the essay which follows should not be misunderstood. May it please the court, this is not a work of history. It is a work of advocacy. The intention is not primarily to inform but to exhort. The aim is not to be objective. It is to be, to be partisan. I plead the case of states' rights. And then he says, my thesis is that our union is a union of states, that the meaning of this union has been obscured, that its inherent value has been debased and all but lost. Again, he said this in 1957. He continues, I hold this truth to be self-evident, that government is least evil when it is closest to the people. I submit that when effective control of government moves away from the people, it becomes a greater evil, a greater restraint upon liberty. My object, my object is not to prove that the powers 
and functions of government have grown steadily more centralized, more remote from the people. For that proposition requires no proof. It requires only that one opens one's eyes. Rather, my intention is to plead that the process of consolidation first be halted, then reversed. Toward the end, that our federal government may be strictly limited to its constitutional functions and the states may, be, may again be encouraged to look after their own affairs, for good or ill. A long time ago, the geometric mind of Edmund Pendleton offered a theorem. The state and federal governments, he said, must follow the paths of parallel lines. Others have conceived the relationship in terms of spheres, separate but touching. The idea, when all this began, was that neither authority would encroach upon the other, and in the beginning, it was more feared that the states would usurp federal powers than the other way around. Now the rights and powers of the states are being obliterated. The encroachments of the federal government have widened its road to a highway and narrowed the road to the states to a footpath. Having deceptively added a dimension to the federal line, the broad constructionists declare their faithful adherence to the plans of the original draftsmen. Soon, a geometry, a geometry unknown to Pendleton can proclaim the apparent miracle of parallels that meet this side of infinity. I do not know that the sovereign powers of the states may be regained at all. Justice Salmon P. Chase once remarked with great satisfaction that state sovereignty died at Appomattox. But I do most earnestly believe that an effort must be made to regain these powers. The alternative is for American government to grow steadily more centralized, steadily more remote from the people, steadily more monolithic and despotic. And of course we talked about we've talked about in the Abbeville Institute how America is too big. I mean if you go out to our YouTube channel there's a wonderful little video on that. Is America too big? This is exactly what Kilpatrick is saying in nineteen fifty seven. Only the states themselves can make the effort which is to say only the people of the states, only the, if the citizens of Virginia as Virginians of, or as Texas as Texans or of Iowa as Iowans insist upon a strict obedience to the spirit of the Tenth Amendment can the federal juggernaut be slowed. Only if the people evidence a determination once more to do for themselves can the essential vitality of a responsible and resourceful society be restored. I do not despair, he says, so long as the I-beams and rafters of the Constitution remain undisturbed the ravages of federal encroachment may be repaired. A latent yearning for personal liberty, an inherent, inherited resentment against the authoritarian state, a drowsing spirit of independence, these may be yet awakened. But again, the states as states will have to do it, he says. It will not be easy. In many influential quarters, it will not be popular. It is a sweet narcotic that centralists sell. If there is still high example to be found in what the states have done before to preserve their identity. They have not always been spineless. In times past they have resisted, now successfully, now unsuccessfully, but even in their failure something has been gained merely in the assertion of state convictions. My purpose here, he says, is to first to examine the basis of state sovereignty, then to follow the state and federal relationships from the beginning under the Articles of Confederation through its refinement to the Constitution, next to review some of the comment on the role of states we're expected to play. The place of the states scarcely has been fixed. It will be submitted before advocates of consolidation began to whittle it down. First in the Chisholm case, which led to the 11th Amendment, and more memorably to the Aliens Edition Acts, which led to the Doctrine of 98 and the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions of that year. It is proposed to follow this doctrine of the state's right to interpose in its various forms and applications down through the years, with particular emphasis upon the dangers of judicial encroachment and the need for state resistance against it. Finally, I have in mind to marshal some of the evidence which supports the case for the South and its immediate conflict with federal authority, and to review some other recent events that seem to me usurpations of the state's reserved powers. So much, then, for the plan of this book. The political heirs of Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall will not care much for it. And that's true. So Kilpatrick was writing this in 1957, but much of this could be said today. I mean, here we are, you know, 60 years later almost, and the same thing is going on, but even more so. The United States has become more centralized. Every issue is a quote-unquote national issue. The states have become completely emasculated. And some of this, you know, this people don't realize how Richard Nixon did a lot of this in his new federalism. This was an ingenious creation. Uh, Nixon came out with an idea that, well, we're going to call it federalism. What we'll do is we'll block grant money back to the states. 
the states, it was their money to begin with, but yet the our wise overlords in D.C. were saying, here you go, you're going to get this money back, and but we're going to tie all kinds of mandates and strings to it and how you can spend it. That's really just the general government telling the states what they can and can't do with their own money. And so the key to all of this has always been getting off, as, as Kilpatrick called it, the narcotic of centralization. Getting off the cash drip. Gaining independence for the individual. Once individuals become independent, then the states can become independent. Then the political communities can become independent. If you are not independent, if you're addicted to the cash, you're never going to to be able to resist. You know, it's really interesting. Hamilton knew that all the way in the first administration. One of the things they did, and people don't realize this, was get a people addicted to the federal cash. And this was by patronage. You give people jobs, you get them addicted to the cash, and then they will support you hell or high water. And this was true. He was doing it with, with veterans. But this is exactly what was going on. So, as we look at what's happening, the PC attack is a veiled attack, really, on self-determination and free thinking. That's exactly what it is. It's to relegate the people like us into the other of society to show us as being irrelevant. To make fun. I mean, really, the poking fun. And we need to poke fun back because there's so many things to make fun of them for. Uh, the poking fun is to... Put these people in their place, like us, right? I mean, and so it's when you see things where they poke fun of college students who are so hypersensitive, this is good stuff. They need to be made fun of. We need to be lighthearted about this sometimes and show that how stupid these people really are. And it's, it's easy to do, but you got to show how stupid they are. But the point is, of course, to silence free speech, self-determination, free thinking, and then you move forward and you look at uh, policy and how that policy has been so destructive, whether it's centralization. And without centralization, you don't have American imperialism. It can't happen. You have to have centralization. And foreign policy really dictates domestic policy. Because uh, if we're a crusading people, then we have to eradicate on the domestic front anything that might be considered the antithesis or the enemy of the quote-unquote general opinion. So make no mistake, imperialism is tied together both foreign and domestic. And that's exactly what Kilpatrick was getting into in 1957. It's exactly what people were saying all throughout American history, even into the anti-imperialists into the late 19th and early 20th century. This is what they were getting at. Um, and we have to be willing, as Kilpatrick said, to speak plainly in our positions. This is why, you know, in current 2016, why you've got a candidate who is very plain-spoken, why people are gravitating to that, because he's plain-spoken. I mean, people want that. They want somebody who's just going to go out and say the things that everyone's thinking. So you can help us do that again at the Abbeville Institute. You can continue to listen to this podcast and share it around, share our material. If you can't financially contribute, just contribute intellectually. Share our stuff. Let people know what's out there. And I think if we continue to do that... Uh, will help change some minds. And if you can contribute financially, please do so. Um, it will be much appreciated, and it will help us fight this PC monster, which is greater than just flags and symbols. It is designed to destroy, as McWhorter said, dissidence. Dissidence is simply resistance to tyranny. Until next time, good day. Thank you.